Jesus Image Church. I want to welcome everyone watching online. It is 2021. We're going to have an amazing year. There's no better way to start off than worshiping. So Lord, I just pray you would come. You will come in Jesus name. I thank you that we have the privilege to be here today. Of all the places in the world we could be, you chose each and every one of us to be here today. So Lord, I pray we would take advantage of that moment. I pray that we would worship you with reckless limit, without any limitation. We would just go all in, that this would be a moment where we get touched by you, God. So come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your love, fill us with your fire, fill us with your goodness and grace and mercy and love. And above all, I pray your joy would just wreck this place, God, that we would be filled with so much joy, it would carry us through this year. People would ask, how was 2021? You would say, filled with joy, filled with joy in Jesus' name. So Lord, come, do what you do, do what you do best and touch us. Leave us not the same. Nobody in this room will leave the same in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords.
I will give. Keep it there. Sing free.
very gently, very gently. When Solomon commissioned the Levites to sing, they sang in one accord. God has an agenda for the room. And we join that agenda. There are no individuals in these moments. No individual agendas. It's His agenda. We join Him. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Is the Lord. The Lord of hosts. Holy Spirit, we welcome you tonight. We know you're here. We sense your glory and presence. Fill this room. Fill our hearts, fill our thoughts, have the night. We have no plan of our own but you. The river of your spirit is the plan. Flow, wonderful Holy Spirit. Touch people tonight. Spirit, do this tonight. Set my heart on fire. Purify my heart. Purify my life. I want to be like Jesus. Wonderful Holy Spirit, I yield to you. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he wonderful? We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Say hi to a few people and grab a seat, will you? Quickly find your seats. I need the next 10 minutes of your undivided attention. I'm going to ask that nobody move. Can I, Theo, can I have my Bible and my iPad, please? Lord. I keep my Bible in a cover so it stays warm. It's a fiery Bible. Are you happy tonight? Do you feel the Lord here? I do. And it's, but we have to jealously guard what the Lord is doing or He cannot trust us with his manifest presence. The glory and the anointing are way different. 
The glory, his manifest presence, is tended to. It is protected and kept like Adam kept the garden. The anointing is a gift that requires partnership. You and the Lord, and it's where faith operates, but if we're going to break through into the manifest presence of God, then everything matters. Everything, every key, every song, everything matters. And in that moment, we have to come together in one accord. And the church, it's not because the, sometimes there are motives that are off, but that's not the case all the time. But the church needs to learn to move in one accord in the presence of the Lord, to go deeper. And that's my job. So bear with me. If I shut something down, it's nothing personal. I deeply love all of you, and I'm glad you're here. But the only reason you're really here is because the Lord's drawing you. And if his presence lifts, you'll never want to come back. And neither will I. I go to the golf course instead. So I love all of you. Thank you for thank you for being humble enough to receive that. I want to talk to you very quickly, no one moving, about your soul. Your soul. Say this, my soul is precious. Jesus made a statement. He said, what good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And then he said, what, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Can we give enough money to redeem our soul? No. Can we give enough away, away to redeem our soul? No. Can we go to enough events to reclaim our soul? No. Our soul is precious. And Je think of this statement. Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the entire world? So all the world has to offer. Think of that for a moment. Every cent, every building, every nation, every authority, every business. If you could own it all, Jesus said, what good would that be if you lost your soul? Ben mentioned last week the words of Solomon. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Everything we pursue outside of the Lord Jesus is vanity, it's vain. And it will be here one day and be gone the next. Think of that. Jesus spoke about the flowers of the field and the grass that is alive one day and dies the next and is thrown into the fire. That is what life is like. The Bible says, life is but a vapor. You ever seen a vapor? Ever held your coffee in the morning and that steam went up? Doesn't last too long, does it? That's what life is like in comparison to eternity. And the scripture tells us to number our days. Who here is over the age of 25? Aren't they just flying by now? Aren't they? Who here turned 30 and they can't even believe it? It happened. It actually happened. You needed a sozo after it happened. You, it, you never thought it would happen to you. And then 40 came. You never thought that would happen to you. Life is just flying by. And the devil, the enemy of your soul, wants to so distract you with worldly and earthly pursuits that you forget to number your days. 
here's the deal. You can't number your days outside the Holy Spirit. That's why the scriptures cry out for the help of the Lord. Teach me. Teach me to number my days. It is healthy to number your days. It is healthy to remember that one day your eyes will close. Everyone here, I don't care how many kombuchas you drink, it will happen. Everybody here is fighting it. It's interesting. Christians spend their whole life, most of them, securing their souls, wanting to go to heaven, and the time comes and we fight it. Isn't that interesting? Because where there is a gospel deficiency and a presence deficiency, we begin to fear the grave that Jesus already conquered. Isn't that the truth? But the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For the saint or the person who has numbered their days and has yielded their life to Jesus, the moment they close their eyes, they open them in glory. Oh, this is wonderful. This crazy, enslaving, twisted, corrupt world is not our home. Praise God is right. Somebody said praise God. Maybe you love it. I'm here to change it, but I am not in love with the world. I'm in the systems of the world. I love people like Jesus loved the world. But the ways of the world enslave people with distraction, with pursuit. And the scripture says, think of this, the love of money is the root of all evil. So much so that the scriptures, Paul tells the church, rather than sue each other, just suffer the loss. Let them rob you of money or let them rob you of the situation. Why not be wrong, but don't sue a brother? So disconnected was Paul from the love of money. Then he says, don't you know you're going to judge angels? What are you doing taking each other to court? Up your game, in other words, boys. You can't get along, you're going to judge angels one day. He thought from a different place. It wasn't here. And that's why, listen carefully. I said this this morning in Jacksonville. In the tabernacle, in Israel's tabernacle, where God dwelled, their feet were in the dirt. There was no flooring for the tabernacle. But everything above the dirt was beautiful and revealed Jesus. Every color, every fabric, every material revealed the Lord Jesus. Every curtain, the number of curtains, the number of clasps, the altar of incense, the altar of sacrifice, the table of showbread because he's the bread of life, the seven golden lampstands because he's the sevenfold spirit of the Lord, the altar of incense because only worship takes you into the manifest presence. It's all about Jesus. The curtain is the Lord Jesus according to the book of Hebrews. All of it points to Jesus, but their feet were still in the dirt. In other words, God was reminding them, you are but a pilgrim. Your feet are here on earth, but your soul and your eyes need to be lifted to heaven. The busyness of the world has an agenda to keep you from numbering your days until it's too late. until it's too late. Reinhard Bonnke used to say, tomorrow is promised to no one. Eternity is not in front of us. It runs parallel with us. You can cross over at any time. Nobody here is guaranteed your eternity. And here's the deal. Some of you think you just came to Jesus' image tonight to check off your little Jesus' image visit because you saw it on YouTube. No, no, no. You didn't come to Jesus' image tonight. God brought you to Jesus tonight. The Holy Ghost brought you here tonight for a reason. Before you were ever born, the Lord knew you'd be right here tonight. And he brought you to save you. To save you. And the sad thing is, is we don't even know what that means anymore. I 
I live the way I want, but I am, sa I am saved. No, you're not. You can't tell me your eternity is secure when your current lifestyle is not changed. Of course everyone wants to give Jesus their eternity. We just don't want to give Jesus today. The proof that your eternity is secure. And the scriptures do say, make your election sure. The way to know is that your current life is yielded. That your current life has been cleansed. That your current life has been liberated. That's why Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. In other words, he's saying, you don't need to be fixed. You need to be born again. You need me to become your life. You need your old life to die, and I need to fill your body with my life. Not a changed life. You hear this every week. A new life. Born again. A second birth. A new birth. That word means born from above. There is a way to know that you're born again. John's epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, make it very clear how to know who we belong to. And in a nutshell, it's very simple. Is the life of Jesus being expressed through your life? It's very simple. That's why he tells us to love one another. He who doesn't love is not one of us. He is not of God, for God is love. What is he trying to say? If Jesus is living through you, it's proof of your salvation. If he is not, you need to give the Lord your life. This thing's been clouded when it's so clear. So simple, not easy, but very simple. And so Jesus said things like this, before a man builds a tower, he should count the cost. Lest he begin building and doesn't have the resources to finish the tower and bring shame. You only know what is worth living for when you discover what you're willing to die for. Then you'll be alive. The moment you are willing to lose all for Jesus, you'll be truly alive. Jesus said that. He said, he who is willing to lose his life will find it. And he who desires to keep his life will lose it. We don't run our own lives and expect Jesus to accept us on that last day. No, no, no. We lose our lives into his arms. We give all to him. We give our future, our agendas, our plans, our sin, our everything, our will, our pursuits of things that do not bring satisfaction. We give all to Jesus. We lose our life and everything we know about it. We say, Lord, here I am, have me. And in that moment, you come alive with his presence. I want everyone to stand, please. I want every head bowed and eye closed, please. If you feel the Holy Spirit tonight convicting you, that is a sign that God is reaching out to you, friend. And the Bible doesn't say today is the day of salvation. The Bible says now, now, now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. I want to invite you to give your all to Jesus with every head bowed and eye closed. You say, Michael, I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. I want to fully repent and surrender. I want to fully lose my life and hand it over. I want every hand to go up that wants to do that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise. If you raised your hand or you wish you did, I want you to get down here right now. Come on. There are many of you. Come on. Come on. Come down here. When, I want you to spread out when you get down here. Come. Come give your life to Jesus. Come. Let nothing hold you back. Let nothing hold you back. Come give your life to the Lord. Young and old. Young and old. Children, children, if you want to give your life to Jesus tonight, you tell your parents. 
Come, come, they're still coming. Look, if you, children, if you wanna give your life to Jesus tonight, tell your mom and dad, go down there with me. I wanna give my heart to Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Did you come with this young man? Yeah, please come with him. Please come with him. Come on, give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Thank you, Lord. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. If you brought someone tonight, or you're here with someone, and you know they may need to come down there, I want you to look them in the eye with boldness and say, do you need to go down there? And if so, tell them you'll go with them. Do it right now. Do it right now. This is the time. This is the hour. There is nothing to be ashamed of. Come on, give your life. Come on, give your life to Jesus tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There is nothing in this world worth choosing above the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing. Come, come, come. Come. Thank you, Father. Look at this world, shaking at its core, filled with uncertainty. Only Jesus is a rock. Come. Come, young man. Take him over there, there, Ryan. Lead them over there. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Thank you, Father. He's so good. The Holy Spirit's moving. Friends, if you came forward, look me in the eye. Please look me in the eye. This is a holy, sacred moment. The last thing we're going to do is just go through some vain repetition, some routine, so that your sins can get blotted out. They will, but there's something much more beautiful. There's going to literally be a life for life exchange tonight. You're going to give the Lord your life, all your sin, everything you've ever done to grieve his heart. And it happens thousands of times a day in all of us. And by faith, you're going to hand your life over. And the Lord will nail all of that to that cross, to a tree. And the Bible says that we were crucified with Christ. And because we've been crucified with Christ, we will be raised with Christ Jesus. This is awesome. And so we're about to begin praying. And as we do, I don't know how to say this any better, but this way. Make it as childlike as possible. And make it as real as you know how to. Deep in here. Let your heart connect with your words. And here's the beautiful thing. The scripture says that if we come unto him, he will not cast us away. He doesn't know how. Are you ready to pray? Close your eyes. Just lift your hands as an act of surrender. I want all of you in your seats to stretch your hands towards these precious people. Stretch. And this is, again, this is what you're praying as I'm praying with them. You're praying that they would never know a day away from the Lord, that they would live a victorious Christian life filled with the Holy Spirit, and that, that they would remain in the fold forever and change the world. Amen? Let's all pray this together. Let's go. Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight a sinner. Save my soul. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me. I am sorry, Lord. Forgive me. Lord, I repent of my sin. I turn from my sin. I turn from the world. I turn from the devil. And I turn from my own will. And I put all my trust in you, Lord Jesus. All my faith in you. All my faith in your shed blood. I give my life to you. Jesus, I believe that you came to the earth. That you suffered and died on the cross. That you shed your blood to redeem my life. I believe 
that you died, that you were buried, and raised again. You are God Almighty, raised from the dead, and you have ascended to the right hand of the Father. You are returning again to rule and reign. You are the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. I give you my life. I give all to you. Come into my heart. Save my soul. In Jesus' name. I am born again. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, come on, give him praise one more time, one more time. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Would you just look at me just for two more minutes? I know that gets boring, just but just bear with me. There's no reason you have to live in defeat ever again. But there's some things I want you to do. Some things the Lord wants you to do. Number one, now that you are His, read His Word every day. Every day. Take your Bible and just begin reading like a child. And when you have questions, ask. Every day. How often will you read your Bible? Every day. Number two, pray every day. That's very simple. You just go in and talk to the Lord. The Word of God will birth prayer inside of you. Because you're going to have questions. You're going to be amazed. The Lord's going to show you Himself. You're going to be blown away. And that's going to come out of your mouth. And before you know it, you'll start praying. It's that simple. Number three, you need to be baptized in water. And John and Jenna, John, and Jenna, raise your hand. They are leading our new believers. And it's vital that after this service, please, please look at me. I need you to go find them after the service because it's vital that you're baptized in water and they're going to help make that happen. When you go into the water, you are literally cut off from this generation in the world. Completely separated from it and the old man. It's vital that you're baptized in water. So one, read your Bible every day. Two, pray every day. Three, get baptized in water. Number four, you need to plant your life into a body of believers. That's called church. Don't let the word church freak you out. You still need it. As jacked up as the church is and has been, you still need the church. It is the body of Christ. We would love to have you here. If God calls you somewhere else, thank God. But you need to plant your life. And I don't mean just attend. I mean become a part of the life of the church. Find a church that believes the whole Bible, the whole Bible, and not by word only, but is willing to take the risk to actually live it. Number two, number two, find a church that loves the presence of Jesus because the presence of Jesus is Jesus and the church should love the head of the church, don't you think? It's important. Lastly, Jesus promised that you would receive power. Say power, all of you, say power. Why is that important? Because it was the power of the Holy Spirit that grabbed your soul tonight. And God wants you to do exactly what I did tonight, maybe in a different way. Maybe you're not called to stand on the platform. But the Lord wants to lead many people to the beauty of Jesus through your life. The good news is, is you don't have to do that on your own. God doesn't want you to do that on your own. He wants you to do that through the same power that Jesus walked in on the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit. So number one, read your Bible every day. Number two, pray every day. Number three, connect with John and Jenna, all of you after service to be baptized in water and so that we can walk with you. Number four, plant your life in the local church. Number five, ask Jesus to empower you with the Holy Spirit so that the world around you can be changed. Many of you have family members who need Jesus. They need to know the peace that you just discovered tonight. God can use you. God can use you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let me just pray a quick prayer over you. Heavenly Father, bless them. Keep them. Protect them. 
use them. I plead the blood over them and empower them. Holy Spirit, come upon them. Use them for your glory. Touch them as you did in my life as a young boy here in the city. Fall on them the same way. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? All of you can go back. You can all go back to your seat. But after service, the table is right outside the door. Make sure, John and Jenna, put your hands up one more time. Make sure to find John and Jenna. God bless you. Let's give the Lord praise one more time. Come on. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Babe, do you want to come up? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Let Jess know you love her. Wow. Mucho. Oh. I love you guys very much. How was everyone's Christmas and New Year? Good? We got a puppy. He's already eaten up one of my tables, but pray that he gets trained in Jesus' name. Uh, yeah, I'm going to share offering tonight. It's offering time. Yes. I was actually reading through this um, yesterday just in my daily devotion with the Lord, and I was thinking, if I get asked to share offering again, I want to share this. And Michael said, I said, babe, will you do offering? And I said, sure. So I'm going to be reading from Exodus 35. I'm going to skip around a little bit so you can just follow me. But Exodus 35, 5, 21, 22, 29. Let's real, real quick, let's go to Exodus 25, 1 through 2. There's a pattern here that, that God was speaking to me about. The Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings. Accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them. Exodus 35, verse 5, and I'm going to again go from 5, 21, 22, 29. I encourage you in your own time to read through these scriptures. They will really bless you like they did me. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. 21. All whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offering to the Lord. Verse 22. Both men and women came, all whose hearts, are you seeing the theme here? All whose hearts were willing, they brought to the Lord their offerings of gold, brooches, earrings, rings from their fingers, and necklaces. They gave it all. They presented gold objects of every kind as a special offering to the Lord. 29, verse 29. So the people of Israel, every man and woman who was eager to help in the work of the Lord, had given that the Lord had given them through Moses, brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. Then in verse in chapter 36, verses two through seven, I'll just summarize. They were building the sanctuary, the tabernacle, and they gave so willingly. And so with the heart of giving that they came, Moses had to come to the people and say, stop giving. We have more than enough. We have more. Could you imagine if you are at a church and they're raising money for a building and they say, no more, don't give anymore. We have more than we need. That's the heart of generosity. And I thought the Lord was challenging me and I feel like God is inviting us to go above and beyond, not just with what we give, but our time to Jesus, our love, our generosity to others. When you see people in public, go tell them about Jesus. It's time to go above and beyond. And that's why these passages, I just kept reading them and I kept seeing the theme. They all were so willing. And that's why, that's why they said, go to those who have a heart that's willing to give. And I just lovingly challenge you tonight. I'm, I'm challenging myself, my children. Let's go above and beyond for Jesus. Isn't he worth it? Isn't he so worth it just to go above and beyond for him? So yeah, we know that the tithe is 10%. You know, my kids and Michael, they got cash for Christmas. 
my parents now and my relatives give me like uh, pots and robes now. So I don't get cash anymore. It's like an ethnic thing. My grandmother, we used to get $100 every Christmas. I have about 28 first cousins. And I would get so excited. And then when I got engaged to Michael, I got a robe instead of $100. So it's like, you know, my kids got cash. And the first thing they did is they, of course, wanted to spend it. And they said, no, mom, we put aside our tithe and we put aside our offering and then we're going to go spend the rest because that belongs to the Lord. But I want us all to have a heart to give and to love to give to Jesus and have a willing heart. Amen. So, yeah, let's just pray real quick. Lord, I just ask, Lord, that you will give us hearts, Jesus, hearts that go after you, hearts that are happy, Lord, to give God, because it is more blessed to give than to receive Jesus. So, Lord, I ask that, Lord, even if there's anyone in here, even even me, Lord, if there's ever times in my life where I don't want to give willingly and freely and give with all of my heart, Holy Spirit, I ask that you will make us cheerful givers. In Jesus' mighty name, bless your people, Lord. Answer every prayer because you are good and you love to give your children good things. You're a loving Father. So answer every prayer. Yes, Lord, even salvations, Jesus. I just, when I said that, this is not about offering, but I just feel like there's people praying for loved ones. So, Lord, yes, Lord, I thank you, Father, that they will come to know you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. You can give text to give. It's on the screen, 321-320-8040, or you can come and give in the buckets. Love you. If you're watching online, thank you. Can we all welcome the online yes. We love audience. you guys. We love you guys. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I want to invite you to click on that link and give via text to give. We love you. Thank you to all of you who have been supporting the ministry. You know, we fell about, I think, fifty or $60,000 short on Jesus 20, and I made a simple announcement to you all and to our online family, and within a day, it was all covered. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Give the Lord praise. Yeah. So you guys can come, rush the buckets. God bless you. back there that was a good moment you guys remember that night here no I do (laughs) let's just close our eyes lift our hands to heaven wonderful Holy Spirit speak to us change us thank you for what you've done tonight and what you will do in the name of Jesus amen amen okay thank you Um, yet this morning I spoke in Jacksonville at our dear friend Gary Wiggins Church at Evangel Temple. It's a real historic church that really has stewarded a, a beautiful, beautiful family in the presence of God for a long time. I had the joy of taking six of our third year students uh, with me on the trip and we had an amazing night last night together. Uh, really just pouring into each other. They blessed me. Hopefully, uh, I blessed them back. But I began to listen to them. And uh, Cammy, can you come here real quick? Just come here. This is Cammy. Cammy is a... Come here, Cammy. So... 
since your third year, you get to hold the lightsaber. Come up here, but I'm trusting you. And you know, you want the force to stay with you. So steward it wisely. But Cammie, Cammie began to talk about, um, here, there you go, Cammie. <laughs> Cammie uh, began to talk about uh, her life and uh, the sadness that you were walking through for, what, 30 years? How long? Long time. Long time. And um, I don't get as much one-on-one -on -one time as I'd like with the students, but to hear their stories last night was just uh, amazing and beautiful. But can you just in a couple minutes talk, just tell them what you told me. I mean, I know you're not going to say it the same way, but it was just so powerful. Go, go ahead, Kim. I was just thanking Michael for the privilege of being here, but also um, I've been a believer for 30 years, and um, for most of my children's lives, they grew up with a really sad mom, and depression and sadness just marked my life, but I knew there was more, and um, I came here because I knew there was more. I'd walked in a really conservative environment, and everything, I was telling Michael how grateful I am because everything that I know about this spirit-filled life, I've learned in the last three years of being here at Jesus School. And um, I understand who I am now. I understand righteousness. I understand laying my life down before the Lord and giving up everything to be here. And um, I really w just wanted to thank Michael. He was asking us to just talk about what the Lord's done in our life, and I'm not sad anymore. <laughs> Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> tell them, tell them when you went home, what your family said, and tell them where you're from, and yeah, because I mean, you're kind of far from home. Yeah. I so I moved here from Colorado. I left my children, my grandchildren, and my parents, my siblings, and um, I was talking to one of my daughters in particular, telling her that I feel like now the Lord has. The way I say it is my heart got seated here and um, that I'm not going to be going home anytime soon. And my daughter in particular, she said, Mom, we watch you and we know how happy you are. We can see you are. My parents always say she's finally found what she's looking for. Wow. So you, you walked in like a heavy sadness for, for how many years, would you say? I, I feel like sadness marked my life since I was a child. Wow. And then you came to school and the Lord touched you. Yeah. Uh, don't you think we're a conservative environment? <laughs> no? No? <laughs> You're laughing. No, I had a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was so beautiful that, you know, if you're dealing with that tonight, yeah. if you're dealing with heaviness and sadness and the thought that it will never turn, yeah. you're looking at a living testimony yeah. right here. You, I love you. you. I'm glad you're here. You. I'm glad you. you're here. Let her know you love her. Would you do that? I want uh, Diane. Come here, Diane. Come on. This is Diane. She's amazing. And uh, would you uh, talk to the people about what you left to come here and then what the Lord in your heart. And this, by the way, this is not a Jesus School promo, but I was so moved last night because it's bigger. It's much bigger than that. It's a picture and a beautiful, uh, uh, it's a beautiful picture of what walking with Jesus looks like and what he does when you do so. Um, yeah, so uh, I was really, really hungry for Jesus. Mm. Um, I was a believer. I loved the Lord. I was serving him for like 15 years. Here in Orlando? In Orlando. And... Um, I was longing for more, and I knew there was more, but I didn't know how to get it. And the Lord said, you're going to have to lay down some things because you've made them your first love. Mm. 
And I want to be your first love. And they were good things. It was a career. It was a home. <laughs> like How long it, were you in that career? 30 years. 30 wow. years. And what and, did you uh, do? What was the career? I'm a CAT scan technologist. Wow. That sounds really important. <laughs> and, and very It's not that important. Complicated. <laughs> a little complicated. But, um, yeah, and so the Lord started to tell me that if I wanted more that love was a commitment, that it looked like something. And so I needed to lay down some things and um, that these are things that would burn up in the fire. They were wood, hay, and stubble. And, uh, wow. and he said, I want you to start to build with me and you can get, and what I, what I got was the Lord. I got more of him wow. because I laid down those things that I thought were important. I thought that the world says they're important, right? Like mm -hmm. you need a career, you need a home. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think they were bad things, but they were standing in the way of my relationship with Jesus. And so when I laid them down, he became my first love. Wow. And you enrolled in school? And yeah. So, well, I mean, it didn't. Yeah. I, I laid down my career first, came mm -hmm. to Jesus school. Someone stepped in, completely provided for like a year's salary, pretty much. Really? Yes. Wow. And um, that was beautiful. But then the second year, he called me. He said, will you lay that down again? Wow. Will you lay down your house again? And I said, yes, I want more of you. And when I did that, he started to give me things to build on because I could build with him now. Wow. It was no longer, there was no longer things in the way. What's happened? How do you feel now? How's life now? Oh my gosh. I'm like, in, <laughs> I'm like in his perfect will. I feel like I am in the perfect will of God. Like wow. I am exactly where he wants me and I have, have more, the, I mean, I have Jesus. I have everything. <laughs> He's so everything. beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Come on, let her know you love yeah. her. So wonderful. I love you. I love you. And Mike. Can you make sure that's off, Ryan, that mic? Isn't the Lord good? Isn't he good? I just felt to share those two. Um, wow. We had one of our students uh, burn her hand, and I heard that her hand got healed. Is that what happened? Her wrist got healed. Um, is, she, is she here tonight? What? Victoria, are you here tonight by any chance? Does, it, does, does anyone know about the testimony? Someone shared it with me. Dion, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. This is Dion, by the way. Come here. Come on up here, bud. Tell the people what happened. Uh, first, is, is Victoria here? Is she in the overflow? I'm, I read the No, she's not here. First hand. All right, well, we have a student named Victoria, and um, I don't know exactly how she burnt it, but it was her, it was like right here. Did she here. share this with you? Yes, yes, she did. Okay. She gave the testimony in front of the, the school. Wow, okay, I want to hear it. But she had burned herself right here on her arm, um, right below her, her palm, and it had gotten infected and the infection had gotten so bad that it literally ate her skin all the way down to the bone and she could see the bone no in, uh, in her wow. wrist. And um, so she, went to the, she finally went to the emergency room because she, she couldn't sleep through the night because of the pain and everything. And the doctor was like, do you want to lose your hand? Why didn't you come sooner? Like she could have lost her hand because the infection was so bad. And so she went home and, um, and her, her daughter, uh, I think, I don't can't remember how old her daughter was, <laughs> but her daughter was like, don't worry, mommy, the blood of Jesus is over it. And she was like, oh, I, I know, baby, I know, I understand, I understand, but things like this take time to heal. And her daughter was like, no, mom, the blood of Jesus is over it. And so she went to bed that night. Uh, she, had, she had it wrapped up and everything. And when she woke up the next morning, she realized that, wow, I, I slept through the whole night because she had been waking up every night because of the, the pain. pain yeah. And so she woke up, and so she took the bandage off and everything like that, and her wrist was completely healed. Like, she had, like... In one night. Yeah. In one night. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. Do more. Do more. Do more. Wow. But... She, she
she showed it to me, and like she What's literally had, like? she it was like pink baby skin, no like way. brand new skin and everything. What, like did, what, that. what did she think? What she? I, I don't know. You have to ask her. But I'm <laughs> sure she, I'm sure it blew her mind though. <laughs> Dion is leading our our outreach teams. So, how how, uh, how long were you in prison? I was. I had received a ten year sentence in federal prison. I ended up doing eight years and nine months, so about nine years. And, and you got saved in prison. I got saved the six year in prison. And and you got baptized in water in prison. I got baptized in water. And then uh, how did you? I know you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a yes, similar way. What I happened? Did. Well, um, first to to get saved, I had, I was working out and I had herniated uh, some discs in my back or a disc. And this Christian brother came up to me and he was like, he, I went through pain for a whole year. You know, I kept going to the doctor um, and they just kept trying to give me ibuprofen. And uh, this Christian brother walked up and he said, you know, uh, what's wrong? And I was like, man, my back is killing me. And he said, sit down. And he told me about Jesus. And he said, Jesus will heal you. And he said, can I pray for you? And I was like, whatever you Christian people do, just do it, dude. <laughs> and so he prayed for me and like, with day or two, all the pain was gone. Wow. And so I was, I was like, oh, God, you're real. And I got convicted, and I ran down to the chapel in the prison and, like, busted through the doors. And I was like, I need to get back. And they were like, what? <laughs> and like, that's all I knew. Like, I had no comprehension of anything Christian. I just thought I had to get baptized. So I went down there, and he was like, he was like oh, you're serious. And he said, come back in three weeks. And we're going to do baptisms in three weeks. And like that night I had a dream. And in the dream, the prison chaplain was trying to baptize me. And then the guy that prayed for my healing was trying to baptize me. And it was the most vivid dream I had ever had. So I went to the guy that prayed for my healing. And I was like, man, I don't know what this dream is about, but I know it means something. I was like, you were trying to baptize me and he was trying to baptize me. And he was like, well, you know, there, there are two baptisms. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, well, there's a baptism in water, and then there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I was like, okay, what is that? <laughs> and um, so he gave me this book about the baptism, and I read the book. And I was like, well, God supernaturally healed me. I guess, I guess this could be real too. And so I met him. I got baptized in water three weeks later. And then like a couple weeks after that, like two or three weeks after that, I said, all right, dude, I'm ready to do this, this Holy Spirit thing. And um, so he, he took me, he got five brother, Christian brothers from the, the, the prison chapel. And he said, let's go over to this area over here. And I was like, go to this area over here. We're at the church. Where are we going? And they wanted to go to this a little more secluded area. And uh, in my head, the whole time I'm walking there and I'm so nervous because the book just said, pray in tongues, like you'll pray in tongues. And so in my mind, I'm like, what does tongues sound like? Like, I can't fake it. Like, I don't even right. know what it sounds like. Good for you. I was like, well, if it's, <laughs> if it's real, then it's going to be real. Yeah. And so I go out there, and he says, he says, all right, lift your hands. And I lift my hands. And he says, in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit. And he touched my forehead. And he said, if anything, you feel anything bubbling up in you or, or you want to say anything, just let it out. And I'm sitting there, and I just... <sighs> And I like start, this tongues just start coming out. And I mean, literally pouring out out of depths of, uh, that I have no idea existed. And I'm just like, how long did that, uh, and, uh, how long were you in that experience? It, it went on like, it was going on for about five minutes. I'm calling out. And, I'm, and then did my, you feel the power of God I when you left? I felt the power of God coming through me. And in my mind, I was like, how long is this going to last? <laughs> and then after a couple of minutes, I'd say about five minutes, I came out of it. Uh, and I, st I stopped praying in tongues. And like I was tripping over their feet and I'm tripping over my feet. And they're all looking at each other like, whoa. <laughs> and, and I was lit. And then did you start fire. leading people to Jesus in the, after in the that, prison? I, it was over after that. Like I was <laughs> lit on fire. I was consumed by God. Because in prison, all you have is time. So from like 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., it was, it was Jesus all day for two wow. years straight. And wow. then, yeah, <laughs> it came out. It's amazing. I love you. I love you. So powerful. Man. Wow. wow. Incredible. Oh, man. 
Testimonies are an invitation to see it happen again. They're not merely to impress us. Uh, the word actually means to do it again. The, one of the words for testimony means to do it again. So when you hear these testimonies, the Lord can do it in you. And do it in your family. If you have a child in prison or a family member in prison, God can do in them what he did in Dion. Now look, he's leading our evangelism teams. I, I wonder if his family thought when he went off to prison that he'd be leading evangelism teams. <laughs> Isn't the Lord amazing? Mm, so incredible. I wanted to have a, uh, a family night tonight. And uh, we didn't cater Greek food, if that's what you're wondering. The, our students were like, that only means one thing. Because <laughs> my father-in-law comes in once a year and gets them all Lebanese food. Well, we didn't do that tonight. <clears throat> That'd be a big bill. I'd hate for John Reed to have to pay the bill. <laughs> I want to update you guys on some things and kind of let you know where the church is going. Um... I feel like I need to cast some vision and uh, so we can walk together into the plan of God. So as you guys know, uh, I'm not sure if you know actually, but I did, I pastored years ago in California and it was pretty sad to watch. <laughs> I always say that if you, you wanted to stay lost, not get saved and stay sick, we were the church for you. Super encouraging. Uh, we had 400 people our first week, and we grew to 70 in three weeks. And I, I used to tell our team every week, we are a mega church. We're mega small. Yeah. But you know, the Lord, the Lord has to uh, show you how helpless you are without the Holy Spirit. And he's willing uh, to take all the time we need to discover that. The Lord glories in our weakness, not in how ready we think we are. Uh, typically, we think we're much more ready than we really are. And then you, you begin to realize uh, when, when you think the Lord is delaying that it was actually his mercy. Uh, the, I love how Bill Johnson says, he says, the, pre the blessing of the Lord requires the presence of the Lord, and the presence of the Lord is weighty, and weight always reveals fractures. You know, if you're doing squats and you have a, uh, a stress fracture in the shin, you're going to know really quickly because you've added weight to your life. And so the Lord will take all the time you need to expose the fractures, heal them, get you through it, and create the character in you to carry the blessing of the Lord. It's really important. I said it's really important. Maybe some of you, maybe that helps some of you who think God for, has forgotten about you. Not forgotten about you. Uh, he's, he's loving you. He's loving you. And let me tell you, uh, when he blesses you and the responsibility comes, just remember you asked for it. <laughs> but uh, we pastored there. God did great things looking back, but... It was such a brutal environment that my own wife wouldn't listen to my sermons. I'd be like, babe, you coming today? She's like, I'm going to stay home. That was just, no. No. She's watching church. I was on TV, and I'm out preaching, you know. So that's when you know you need a little help. I also learned that, uh, that my father-in-law's encounter with the Lord was not my own. And you can't, uh, you can't look at a cripple and say in the name of my family member, get up and walk. You either have oil or you don't. That's why a lot of PKs never really meet their potential because they think they deserve something that they have not paid for. If you're a PK, sorry, but uh, that's just the way it is. Few, few really meet their potential because they have a sense of entitlement. And God has to blow all that out of you. He has to become your Jesus. He has to become your Savior, your provider, your healer, your sanctifier. You have to meet him on your own. 
So that was really the process, and we moved here in 2010, at the end of 2009, November of 2009. And um, I, I said, I will never pastor again, ever. And so Jesus' image was birthed as an evangelistic ministry. I began traveling, and I preached everywhere. Man, I preached at women's aglow meetings at Marie Callender's, the pie shops. I just preached anywhere. Storefront churches, home groups. I'll never forget my first women's aglow meeting. They loved me. I was like their little baby. They just, they thought I was awesome. I got to speak at the Christmas banquet and everything. It was awesome. One time I got a pie as an honorarium. Didn't pay the bills, but it tasted good. But I kept going. I've never preached for money. I think it's a sin. I think it's a sin. If the gospel's not for sale, why should the people preaching it be for sale? That's a horrible, putrid thing that God is blasting out of the body of Christ and may he pummel it even more until it's all gone. We don't preach for money. We preach because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood and he's worthy of a people, an offering worthy of the nation. So I just went for it and I would spend every Tuesday with God. I mean every Tuesday. Start at six, stop at about five. And I had nothing. I had no, I was preaching a good bit, but most people thought I was crazy. And uh, I wanted to know Jesus and began seeking him. And uh, slowly doors started opening and the nation started opening. And really fathers began to stand around me, fathers and mothers, Heidi, my father-in-law, Reinhard, was a massive encouragement and support to me, Bill, Tommy Reed, Paul Teske, many, many great people. The sisters who are in Phoenix, the evangelical sisterhood, they really just gathered around me and uh, really refused to see me uh, uh, not step into the call of God. Looking back, that was really the mercy of the Lord. At the time in 2010, our uh, Jesse's family walked through a difficult time. Thank God it was all restored and totally healed. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But man, was it a tough time to launch a ministry. Really tough. People looked at me and said, bro, we love you, but you're kind of a liability. And I said, wow, God bless you too. And, 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 and the Lord began to move. And people started being healed. And Amazing miracles took place, blindness, deafness, tumors exploding, literally falling out of people's bodies. And, and the nations really opened. And, and I began to discover Jesus in private and he would jump out of our meetings in public and people began to know the Lord. And my heart was really burning for the nations at the time. And then I had a dream and in the dream, God began to stir my soul for America. This was 2012. I began to feel a deeper connection to the states, not realizing what was coming to our country. But how many of you know that now we can send full-time missionaries into American cities? America has no idea what is about to hit it. I'm telling you. Many of our Jesus School students will take long-term long assignments in American cities, preach Jesus, and carry the presence of God. The devil has no chance. I said, the devil has no chance. So that, that started stirring me. And uh, I began to travel in America more. In 2014, we hosted our first Jesus event. Jesus 14 took place right here in Longwood, Florida at one church. I think we sat 600. And I thought 100 would show up. Uh, we had my father-in-law and Reinhard and then a bunch of my other friends and what a joy it was to get those two together. It was really historic, even though it was in a small room. But I remember thinking, will anyone come? And they did. They came. Maybe some of you were there. I don't know. I know Eduardo was there. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about that later. But anyways. And God really moved. And then we had Jesus 15. Heidi joined the, the squad. I think that's about when Todd came around as well. Jesus 16. Uh, Bill jumped in. We had spent a year or six months in Reading, just resting. The Lord spoke to us to get, 
get ready to see our lives completely transformed. And oh my gosh, how our lives were impacted there. Just watching Bill and lead the way he led. And it was a great time of rest and really um, just beauty for our children. Uh, little Benny was in, encountered the Holy Spirit in like science or some class. I don't know. I mean, they went to school there in Reading. How, how many of you think we should like have schools here where your kids get absolutely rocked by the presence of the Holy Spirit? So that happened and uh, we came home and um, went back one more time because the Lord asked us to. And uh, on our way back, the second time, right before we left, something dropped in my spirit. I was driving down the road on a Eureka Highway, 278 is the highway number there in Reading, and something landed in my spirit. I don't know how to explain it, but I could see. I, I, I don't know how else to say other than it was a Holy Spirit moment. I could see the mastery of the wisdom of God on how to watch God build something here in Orlando. I just saw, I saw the school, I, I, I saw that God would send uh, the nations to Orlando once again like he did when I was a little boy and that the wonderful wells of the presence of the Lord, the preaching of Jesus and the healing power of the Holy Spirit, that that would return again to our city. And I felt the Lord ad adjusting my heart and it was scary while traveling was tough on my body, the sense of responsibility in beginning a school was a bit overwhelming. You know, I just, because I didn't start the school to end it quickly. I knew it would be an all-in assignment. Jesse and I talked about it. Bill and I had dinner. I said, Bill, I'm just driving, and this blueprint landed on me. You know. I think it was that spirit of wisdom and revelation. And I said, I don't know what happened. And he just looked at me and goes, oh, yeah, it's in the air here. I go, oh, <laughs> that helps. <laughs> Gee, thanks a lot. And so then Bill gave me a prophetic word. Before we left, we asked Bill to pray for our family. We went in. And there were many dreams prior to that. And all my time around Bill and my friends there, I'd never seen Bill do this. But he instantly laid hands on me and us and he said, the day is coming where uh, these movements will become family. And he said, and when that happens, a great move of the grace of God will flow from the west coast to the east, and a great move of the Holy Spirit will take place. I thought, wow. So I carried that in my heart and came home. I called, uh, I called our, our board and... Uh, spoke to some of our team. Jesse and I prayed about it. And we said we want to start a school. And in the school, we want to freely give away whatever the Lord has given us. And we want to spend extended stints of time in the presence of the Lord. And we want to teach a people how to minister to Jesus and live in his presence and how to love the Holy Scriptures. That a bridal heart would emerge and we exposed our students to those people that we had been walking with and who touched our lives. So we just went for it. And the first year, 76, 76 students came. It felt like a stadium. You have to remember now, I'd been on the road since 2003. Much of that time with my father-in-law and then from 2010 to 2017 on my own. And I was a bit tired but as I began teaching and walking with the students, something happened in me. And I began to enjoy the journey and see the Lord change them. And something the school provided me was the ability to see what actually changes lives and what does not. Because you're with them every day and the good students let you into their junk. The other ones are just learning to trust us. And I understand. But as I would get into their lives and hear about their lives, Jess would 
get into their lives and our team, I began to discover what ran the devil out of their life. And I said, I'm going to do more of that. So they got the word. I mean the word. And I began to teach John 1. I thought I would teach it for two days. I taught it for eight weeks. And what I found is, is those who had bondages were being set free under the sound of the word of God. So they would minister to the Lord for hours in the morning. We would come and teach. The Lord would come in and crash in on the room. And then we would just step back and let the Lord move. Then another desire was planted in my heart. And the desire was create a space for worship on a Sunday night. It doesn't matter if it's big. In fact, I didn't want it to be big. I mean, I had already seen a crowd of 3 million people in 2205 with my father-in-law. So I, the, the amount of people do not equate to blessedness. So the amount of people do not feed the soul. Only his presence feeds the soul. So whether it's a massive meeting or 76 students in the room, I'm satisfied. I, have, I was no more satisfied at Jesus 20 than I am tonight. Thousands are on the field. There are hundreds here. I'm equally satisfied because it's the same Jesus. Say amen. amen. So I thought, let's just start this Sunday night meeting. I felt like the students needed some type of chapel setting where they could gather and do nothing but minister to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, on those Sunday nights, I want you to preach a clear gospel every Sunday night or I will not send the lost to you. That makes sense. Why would the Lord send the lost to us if we don't preach the gospel? So the Lord blesses people who preach the gospel. He sends people their way. The Lord is an amazing leader, slightly. So I began to preach the gospel on those Sunday nights. The Lord would come in. We were in that little building at St. Andrews. Well, actually, I told Austin, just get me a room that seats 70 people. He goes, bro, what's wrong with you? I said, just give me 70 people. He goes, I said, I don't even think that will fill up. Austin goes, what is wrong with you? He's like, we're not doing 70 people, dude. I go, all right, fine. What is St. Andrew's seat? It was like 400 packed in. 300 seated, 400 packed in. I thought 50 people would come in. I didn't care. I just wanted to be with the Lord. All of a sudden, we booked it, and I pulled up, and there were people parked all over the place. Then I got scared. <laughs> I go, no, 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 <laughs> that's not what I wanted. We just want to sing but not with all these people. And they were standing there, and the air broke that night. How many of you were there? The air broke. It was so hot. I said, Austin, what are we doing? So we burned them up that night. The Lord did beautifully come. It was awesome. Oh, man, it was powerful. The next Sunday came, I pulled up, and as I'm pulling up, I go, there's no way people came back. It was too hot. It was too hot. There's no way. It's sweaty smelly. There's no way they came back. Packed again. Well, a few months later, people started saying, uh, hey, bro, this is a church. And I go, not a church, man. I said, there, well, what is it? I said, it's a gathering. <laughs> it's a Jesus night. And we're like, oh, okay. So Michael Miller came through. I think he preached like a month in. As we were meeting, he looks at me. He goes, bro, this is a church. I go, you stick with upper room. You let me handle Jesus' image. It's not a church. He goes, okay. And while we were sitting there in the glory of God, you guys remember those nights we would just wait on the Lord and he would come? Miller looked at me. He goes, I just had a vision. I see this, this Sunday night meeting in a building that has a massive balcony and there are thousands of people there. And when we stepped into Calvary on two Sunday nights ago, I go, oh, there were people up on the balconies, 2,000 people waiting outside. And Miller's vision, uh, it, it was brought back to me. Amazing, right? So as the weeks went on, I started having other friends in. So Nathan Morris came in. Nathan Morris does not have a passion deficiency when he preaches. <laughs> All right? 
He's full on. And I love him. So he's walking and he gets this wild look in his eye. So he's walking and he looks at me. He goes, call it what it is. Like mid-sermon. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You call this what it is. This is a church. Nathan, keep it moving. Your, your, your time is almost up. Well, then we had Danny Silk. And I'm trying to introduce Danny. And Danny's on the front row. And I hear him talking to Jess. And he goes, uh, I can hear him. I'm at the pulpit, like praying, doing the offering. And I hear him talking to my wife. And I hear Danny go, so, uh, that's what I heard. How often do you guys meet? Jess goes, every Sunday night. He goes, uh-huh. And uh, does he teach the Bible every Sunday night? She goes, yeah. He goes, do you guys give offerings? She goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, this is a church. <laughs> I'm listening to this. I'm like, Let's sing hallelujah and we forget about what Danny said. <laughs> well then, oh, bear with me, I'm just being funny here. Then I made the mistake of having my father-in-law. <laughs> Which, let me tell you something. Childlike and pure-hearted, but he cannot keep a secret. <laughs> at all. In 2005, when uh, Theo was, when Jesse got pregnant, Theo, he was at a meeting and we were backstage about to go out and preach. I said, hey, bub, I got good news for you. He goes, what? I said, Jesse's pregnant. But you, I go, you can't say anything. He goes, no problem. No problem. <laughs> I'm not going to say a word. And we're behind the curtain. Aren't you glad we don't have curtains? All right. <laughs> so I go, bub, you can't say a word. He goes, okay, yeah, 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 no problem. He takes the platform. He goes, you are not going to believe this. <laughs> Jessica is pregnant. <laughs> I go, sorry, babe. She goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So that Sunday night in 2017, would have been 18 maybe by then. I don't know. Probably 18. I don't know. He basically, before I even had the chance to, announced that this is a church. So he takes the mic and goes, this is a church and I'm here to announce it. And I'm like, bub, you can't announce it's a church without me. Like, what are you doing? He goes, sir, I can. So he did. The story of my life. Well, here was the weird thing. Is that while he's praying that this be a church, and then he announced it at Jesus 18 in front of the world, and I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, what are you going to do? So while, he, while he's announcing that over at St. Andrews, basically dedicating this is a church without me even standing next to him, Nathan Morris just walks in. I'm like, bro, what are you doing here? He goes, God told me to come. And remember, Nathan had just told us weeks prior to call this what it is. So my father-in-law looks at Nathan and he goes, this is why you've walked in, Nathan. To confirm it, because it's at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Nathan goes, that's exactly why I've come. I was, home, I was home getting ready to go just lay down. And the Lord said, get up and drive over to St. Andrews. So at that point, I, it was a real sober time. I had to do a lot of soul searching. A lot would have to die in my life. A lot I would have to really shut down, especially travel. Probably travel's been shut down by 60 to 70% for me. And commit my life to the Lord's presence in the people. But I noticed that the, the events have exploded since we've been gathering as a church, and they're more powerful. The outreach element is into the millions now with just media. And I was under the deception that I had to choose between nations being touched and God using Orlando to be a city set on a hill and raising up a people in the presence. In Jesus, you don't really have to choose. You just choose him. And whatever he gives you, you walk in. So uh, that summer we moved. 
down by the airport. You guys remember? We moved down near uh, MCO. And then the summer was up and we needed a building to start Jesus School last year. And this building opened. It was the only building that was available. And I'm super grateful to Pastor Clint and Judah for letting us come. And I want to say that publicly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Due to facility issues, not here, but just in general, availability, we haven't been able to meet on Sunday morning. And we've been wanting to meet on Sunday morning. Now, most people, by the time they get a church this size, they have like three buildings, different campuses. But when you, we have, how many students are not here right now? Like 150, 200? What do you think? What do you think the number is? 100? There's still 100 students who aren't even in the room. So we began to run into this issue. How could we go to Sunday morning? There was nothing available. COVID hit. But I wanted to tell you tonight that we've had a couple facilities open that we could rent in the interim. Just hear me carefully. And we will go to Sunday morning very soon. Hear me out. I know many of you visit here on Sunday nights. We will keep the Sunday nights as well. But it is time to build a church family in the glory of the Lord. Now, Austin will be meeting with people tomorrow. Speaking of the two facilities, we will hear about the details of the availability and which facility is going to work best for our needs. On Sunday morning, I want you to know this, it will be an experience in the presence of God for your entire family. We will have all of the age groups for Children's Church. Praise God. You guys can drop your kids off, not be nervous. Is Michael or Pastor Benny going to rebuke my child for crying? No, you don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> this is a wonderful thing. I'm really excited about this. The Sunday nights will remain because the nations have been flying in. Before COVID, we have, on the average, about 8 to 12 nations every Sunday night who have flown in just to be in the room. And I don't want to eliminate that. So Sunday morning will be for those who are like, Jesus' image is my family. This is my tribe. I am ride or die with Jesus' image. That is, these are my people. And, and I'm going to live in the glory of God with these people. That is the Sunday morning experience. I will teach the word then we will worship the Lord. We're not going to cut the worship time. We're not going to turn into some franchise, cookie-cutter, people-pleasing church. That's not happening. That'll never happen. That will never happen as long as I'm alive. And if it happens in the next generation, I will appear and attack them. I will attack them. I will come back as one of the witnesses and attack them. It's not allowed. You cannot franchise church you can franchise an organization, but only God can birth a church. And I never want this church to be marked with savvy promotion. I never want this church to be marked with man's ability and strength. I want the glory of God to draw the nations. That's who we are. That will never change. It will never change. Ever, never will it change. So that being said, uh, good news, your children will have a place to encounter God. What it will not be is a babysitting service. It will be an inferno for your children. I want your children to be marked by the presence of Jesus. We need the next generation to be marked by the presence of Jesus. There will be Sundays where I will not be behind the pulpit in the main sanctuary. I will be ministering to your children. And I'm not afraid of them. <laughs> I'm not afraid of your children. I used to be afraid of ministering to kids because they stare at you if you're horrible. I, I would always say no to youth events. I'm like, no, I'm not doing a youth event. No way. No, I'm going to stick with Women's of Glow, but I'm not, doing, I'm not doing the youth event. But I'll tell you what kids do when the glory of God shows up. They're all in. So we're going to see our children touched by the power and presence of the Lord. That being said, it will be uh, most likely, these two facilities are in Seminole County. So, um, 
Sunday night we'll stay here, at least until we get our building, our full-time home. Our, I almost said eternal home, but it's not our eternal home. <laughs> Heaven is our eternal home. But the Sunday mornings will most likely be in Seminole County, and we should know by the end of the week, hopefully. Hallelujah. Amen? Okay. Now, let me also just say this last thing, and then we're going to receive communion. Uh, I believe we've had two meetings with the county and the city on the land for the land that we are under contract on. That is also in Seminole County. I need you guys to be praying that God would give us favor. So far, the meetings have gone wonderfully. And we need that to continue. So the two venues we're looking at for Sunday morning will most likely stay there. And from what I've heard, I, I don't want to give you time. I'm just trying to be as authentic and transparent as a pastor as I can be. Most people have given me, as far as a building time, like the 15 to 18 month range to get the building up. But the contract is on about 10 acres right now in Seminole County. It will house our school. We will be able to put up a sanctuary that seats about 1,200, which is a, a, 100 people larger than this. And I don't want it to be any bigger, uh, to be honest with you. I want to keep this intimate feel. We'll be able to divide it for the sake of the school into quadrants. Our hope is to divide it with soundproof systems so that first and second year can meet in certain rooms. We will have our prayer house there and everything. It's going to be phenomenal. Okay. That is on the way. And I just wanted to let you know, we are moving forward at light speed. We are actually under contract on the acreage. And we will, uh, Austin will have a conversation tomorrow about the two rental facilities in Seminole County for Sunday morning. And I am excited. I am excited. The reason, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I feel from the Lord we must make intentional steps into what it looks like to be a church family. And I, with me, I want to see your children's children in love with Jesus. And I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you this. As a child, I burned for the Lord. I burned for the Lord. I was radically touched, and I know what the glory of God can do. And that's what I long for. I want to see families living in the presence of God. That's why Ryan and Jenna moved here. Not Ryan and Jenna, Ryan and Carla. It's why John, John and Jenna are having a baby. I want, y'all didn't know that? They're not having a baby for the church. Well, they kind of are, they're growing the church. <laughs> But I, want, I was thinking about it yesterday. They drove me up to Jacksonville. I said, I want that little baby. I want her to be under the glory of God. Yeah. I do. I want, I want her to live in the presence of God. Ryan, Ryan and Carla moved from Salinas, California, to live in the glory of God. I want my children to live in the glory of God. And it's time. I said, it's time. I am believing the Lord in faith. There is no doubt in my mind that the Lord can do this, that we will walk into that building fully built, debt-free. Debt-free. And when you need a place to pray at 1 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, you'll have a place to come pray. you have a place to be with Jesus. And our Levites, our wonderful worship team, We'll be ministering to the Lord for hours on end, and that place will be bathed in the glory of the Lord. I am believing that when people pull, pull onto that property, that they will know they have stepped into a different place, that they have stepped into heaven on earth. That's my desire. And when I'm long gone, I still want the nations to fly to that place and experience the Lord Jesus. It's possible. I said it's possible. It will happen. Amen? Are you excited? All right, give the Lord praise. I'm excited. I think it's awesome. We've got about 20 more minutes. Can you take your communion elements, please? Baby, did I forget anything? How did I do? Thank you. <laughs> Don't open them yet. I just want you to hold them. 
Just make sure if you don't have elements, we have uh, a, a, a lady there on the right side, stage, stage right. She needs her elements right there, guys. Thank you, Dion. Go ahead and just put your communion down next to you. How many of you have read the first three chapters of the book of Revelation? Okay. I do want this church to read the entire Bible. Uh, we did a survey years ago in a pastor's conference, and we asked pastors, how many of you have not read the, the, the entire Bible? And I would say it was a 60-40 split. Pastors. I'm like, Wait, what are you preaching? What are you talking about? But if you look at these first few chapters here in the book of Revelation, it's really interesting to me in chapters uh, really two through three, as the Lord begins speaking to the churches and correcting them and encouraging them, he never once addresses attendance as being an issue. So never once does he say to the church at Ephesus, uh, your church is too small. You don't have enough people. I have this against you. Your crowd is too small. He doesn't even go there. It's not even on his grid. Attendance has nothing to do with success. How many of you believe that Mary was successful at the tomb when she beheld the resurrected Christ? She's all alone. I said this last week, but if attendance were the marker for success, then Calvary was a failure. There were just a few with him there. Jesus had massive crowds in Galilee, and only a few stayed with him to Calvary. Well, was Calvary less successful in Galilee? No. There's no greater representation of the nature of God than Christ crucified. Jesus laying his life down is the ultimate success, and only a few were there. So Jesus never addresses church size in Revelation 2 and 3. He speaks to the hearts. To the hearts. Say the hearts. Say this very quickly. Say, say, Jesus is after my motives. Last night, did anybody watch the Instagram Live I did with the send last night? Any of y'all watch that? A few of you, okay. Andy Bird asked me a question last night. He said, if you could say one thing to this generation, what would it be? And even to the generation coming up behind you, what would you say to them? I said, this is what I'd say. Go into your room, shut the door, and build a history with the living Christ. Get to know Jesus. I want you to think about for a moment, if you were about to breathe your last and your family was standing around your bed, what would you tell them? Would you tell them to go build a big church? To go do a big meeting? Book a stadium? I'm not against it all, we do that, but is that what you'd tell them? Is that what you'd leave them with? Is that what you want your tombstone to say? I did big meetings. I built big churches, I'm a church planter. I want you to think about that for a moment. What would you tell your child if you had one thing left to say? I know what I'd tell mine, love Jesus. And once you have that answer, my challenge to you is live for that and that alone. And you'll never know lack in any area of life. Jesus, listen carefully, is purifying his bride. Deeply purifying her right now. As I said to you last week, a wedding is coming. That didn't excite you. I said, a wedding is coming. 
a wedding is coming. The bridegroom is on the way. And the bride is making herself ready. By giving access to the Holy Spirit to purify her motives, the why she does what she does. Listen very carefully to me. If God didn't birth it, he will not bless it. If God doesn't birth it, he will not accept it. But there's something, there's something in the flesh that longs to be the hero. We want to be the hero rather than point to the hero. Interesting to me that on the seventh day, God rested and God called the seventh day blessed. Rest is blessed. Fleshly activity is cursed. God doesn't need our compromise to build his kingdom. God doesn't need us to put a tool to the altar that requires no tool. So what he told the Israelites, he told, told them, put no tool to the altar. In other words, I don't need your help. I just need you on the altar. God is challenging his people right now. We have to let him challenge us. We have to let the divine light of the Spirit to get down into why we do. Why does Dom pick the song she picks? Does it matter? Why do we pass the offering tray? Does it matter? Why was that post up? Why did Jesus' image post that? Does it matter? You better believe it matters. It all matters. When God gets into the motive, God begins purifying his bride. We talked, last, we talked about this last week, that God is after a bride with like nature, with like image that looks like the bridegroom. I want to challenge everyone here. Give God access to your motives. Allow him to say, why are you doing that right now? And I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about what looks like good stuff. I will have to answer to God as to not only the content of what I preach, whether or not it's truthful and scriptural, which I pray that it is, with everything in me, I believe in that. But I will have to answer to God as to why I preached everything I preach. Because he sees things that the crowds don't see. He sees every manipulation. And what we do is we say, well, God will use it. Well, people will get saved. Well, it will grow the church. Well, it adds numbers, and numbers are people I've heard it all. But God doesn't need our compromise to add to his church. With everything inside of me, I want to look back at my life on the day I go home and say, the Lord has done the work, and it is beautiful in our eyes. With everything in me, I have never dreamt about the size of anything. I have dreamt about his presence. I think maybe the, some of the students last night asked me, did you ever think this would, or something, I don't remember, but I remember it, it triggered. Like, did you ever think God would do what he's doing? And I said, I wouldn't have even known to ask for it. I didn't know it was there. I was too busy staring at it. I never dreamt about the magnitude of events or the magnitude of a church or the 
magnitude of a school I've dreamt about the Lord coming. That's what burns in me, is the Lord coming. I want Jesus to come. And when he comes, I want him to more fully manifest himself because that means he can trust us. That's what I want. I want the visible glory of the Lord to shine on us and to shine in this room because that would mean something. He is trusting us with his feelings. That stuff I dream about. He's readjusting. He's reestablishing what it truly means to be successful in his eyes. I have no desire to use worldly means to get people into a room. I want the glory of the Lord to draw you into the room like a magnet. I want you to walk through these doors all giddy inside. Oh, I wonder what will happen tonight. What will the Lord do tonight? What will he say to me? How will I touch him? I wonder what will happen in worship tonight. Oh, Lord, I pray we find that seam and just disappear into his presence until we forget we're even singing and we're lost in his glory. That's the kind of thing I want you to think about. I want you to think about who will get born again and conveyed out of darkness into the glorious light of the kingdom of God. I want you to come in like a little child having no idea what will happen in the room because Jesus is not a mechanism. May that die in America. How, how, explain to me how we absolutely know that God is done moving in 70 minutes. How can we be so sure? Yet our thought process is, well, it's about the lost. People want to get home. The Sunday morning. We can't go too deep on Sunday morning. People have needs, so we construct these mechanisms to get people. But what if we put all of our efforts into bringing Jesus? I'm serious. What, what if our meetings that were planned around bringing people we're changed into meetings and we open the word and we go, what does he love? What brings his presence? Oh, does he like Thanksgiving? Let's do some songs on Thanksgiving. Should we enter his courts with praise? Let's adjust the set. Let's make sure there's Thanksgiving and praise out front. If that's what he likes, let's give it to him. And should we enter into worship until we are have been benched and God takes the field, as Arthur Wallace said, should we just do that? It seems to be in the scriptures. Let's do that. Let's take our time and pray if God answers prayer. Let's pray rather than strategize so much. I'm not saying that's bad, but don't replace prayer with strategy. This is who, this is what God is doing. He's Getting in, he's saying, look, look, you can have an auditorium with 10,000 people if Jesus isn't there. It's a failure. You can have a room of 100 if he's there. It's heaven on earth. I want Jesus. And I want you to want Jesus. I know there's pastors listening. I love you. But I, I get messages. Can you tell us how, what's going on there? How do you find the musicians? I don't know. I don't know where they came from, like from Mars. How did you get the dancers? I don't know. They just showed up. Where did the singers? I don't know where they came from. How did you get a choir? I don't know. We just said we should have a choir. God did it. What about these people? What are you doing? How, how do you get them here? I don't know. We don't think about it. They love Jesus. We love Jesus. We want Jesus to come, and we want them to be with Jesus. They seem to like it. I don't know. So how did people getting saved? We preach the gospel. Well, how do they get healed? You pray for the sick. Not a single breakout meeting. We don't have a single whiteboard in there. 
There's not a whiteboard in that room, but there are tears on the carpet. Do you think Peter and Paul and the disciples were going with little Sharpie markers going, all right, at 847, we're going to transition. And at, nine, at 903, we'll get out of the way. And at 917, we're going to go into that song, at which point we'll ask for text to give. How did we get there? No, I'll tell you what they were doing. They were crying out in one accord, asking for the living Christ to fill their meetings. That's what God's doing. I've had the other stuff. I tried it. I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to look back at my life and go, I did that. I did that. That would make me break inside. I did that. The people don't know that I did that, but I know I did that. You and I know it, Lord. I did that. That was the flesh. No, no. I, I want to look back at my life and say, the Holy Ghost did it. And it's beautiful to watch. You say, well, what's this, any of this have to do with me? I'm not leading a church. How you walk in changes everything. The way you come in determines the night. And when Jesus comes in the room, the person four rows behind you with stage four cancer gets healed. It matters how you come in. If you walk in going, I cannot wait to hear Michael preach, that's not the best way to walk in. But if you come in going, I'm coming in the name of Jesus, and I cannot wait to worship him, and I have no idea what he's going to do. I just know it's going to be wonderful. And I have come to pour my life out. I have not come for me. Because the church is not about me. It's about Jesus. And Jesus just helps me when he comes anyways. So this is just about him. All the songs are for him. That's why I say stand now. Because I sense the Lord's presence. I want us to learn how to live with him. There is more. I said, there's more. I just prayed for a lady with stage four cancer who did not get healed. That bothers me. That bothers me. It should bother you. I'm sick of that demon. I'm sick of that Goliath taunting the people of God. I'm sick of the fear that it causes families. I'm sick of the, 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 the damage it does. And I'm tired of seeing what it does to the psyche of people. I'm tired of seeing people freaking out over this thing and other sicknesses. There's more. We have to go deeper. I want people to walk in and before the first song takes place, I want those sicknesses to leave because Jesus is in the room. That has happened before and it is possible. And that is what I'm burning for. If there's eight of us in the room and that happens, I'm good, but there's more. Jesus is restoring this bridal heart. He's purifying us. Who who cares about what the world would see as being great? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. I know I'm intense about this thing, but it's, it's just, it's what God's doing. Many of you lead ministries in the room. Give the Lord the ministry back. Give it to him. Give him your careers. Give him your goals. Some of you think you've got this great future publicly. Give that to him too. Who cares? Who cares about, who cares about people seeing you when heaven sees you? There's ten thousands of ten thousands upon millions of angels. They all see you. It's a big crowd. Give him everything. Whether he uses you in a certain way or not, just give it. And, and, and everyone here, listen carefully, and then I'm going to pray for you. We're going to receive communion. Everyone here will be faced with this crossroad. You mark my words. 
Anyone here who's been handed something, anyone, if you stay close to Jesus, he will ask for it back. And that's hard. That's called surrender and death. God gave Isaac to Abraham as a miracle. And then he said, give him back. I'm sure Abraham said, but you gave him to me. Why are you taking him? Possibly God's response would have been, I'm taking him because I gave him to you. Give him back. Do you know why? Because God refused to share Abraham's heart with Isaac. And whatever you give back to the Lord, he multiplies. Lord, tonight we've come to you, to your table, hearing, hearing what you're saying. Lord, I ask for mercy on my own life. Have mercy on me. You know my heart. You know how much I love your people and I love your church. But Lord, you are adjusting your people. You're adjusting your church. You are purging her. You are purifying her. You are cleansing her, of which I need it the most. Help me, Lord. Help me. Help me actually be what I'm talking about. Help me live this way. Let everything else disappear, please. Let it all just go. Be the light in my eyes. Be the light of my vision. Blind me to everything else. Please, Lord, do it. I don't want to preach something that I'm not walking in, so I need your mercy. I need your mercy here. I need your mercy for these people. I need your mercy, Lord, for this school and this church, that this would not just be theory, that this would actually be what's happening. So, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on the leaders. Have mercy on every student, every church member, every leader of every ministry here. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us build in a way where you build. You said, I'll build my church your job and when you reward us in heaven and give us these crowns we'll cast them down at your feet you've done the work oh you've done it Lord and it is marvelous and beautiful in our eyes so Father in Jesus name we come to the table tonight asking we repent we repent we repent Lord we repent for trying to turn people to us we want to turn them to you Cleanse our souls, cleanse our minds, cleanse our motives, cleanse our deeds, our works, what we offer you, our lives, our businesses, our families, our ministries, our children. Cleanse us all. We ask you, Lord, to shine your glorious light in our lives. And we examine ourselves tonight that we not be judged. Forgive our sin. Lord, on that night, the night you were betrayed can I have another one Ryan this one's not working so well thank you thank you Lord on the night you were betrayed you took bread you broke it let's lift the bread and break it don't don't receive it yet I want to pray Lord you said is the bread that is broken and blessed is it not the body of the Lord Jesus let's break the bread don't receive it yet just break it we break the bread Lord because you were broken and lifted high and we lift the bread because you were lifted on the tree and we declare your death until you return as the word says so tonight as we receive the body of the Lord Jesus I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would flood this room and heal the sick. I pray in Jesus' name that every emotional issue would die, that every anxiety and depression would go, that every disease, every chronic pain, every uh, arthritis would go, every fibromyalgia would go, 
every immune disorder would go in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we come to the bread, the very bread of life that you said was broken for us, and we do it tonight in remembrance of you. Receive in faith now the body of the Lord Jesus. Receive your healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, in the same manner, you took the cup. You said this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood that is shed for you for the remission of sin. Let's lift the cup once you've opened it. Precious Lord, I plead the blood over every person here tonight, over every baby, over every child, over every mom and dad, over every, every person, Lord, every, every preacher, every pastor, every person under the sound of my voice, every home watching. I plead the blood over you, and I thank you for the blood that speaks a better word, that is the better covenant, and that your covenant is in the blood. Let the blessings and the fullness of your covenant be experienced now as we receive the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's receive. Just wait there for a moment in his presence once you've received. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Holy are you. Holy are you. If you need a healing tonight, just offer your body to the Lord. Right now, just say, Jesus, I give you my body. Place your hand there on that part of your body that needs healing. In faith, just place it there. If you came with someone, ask them to agree with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke every sickness here, every sickness under the sound of my voice. Be whole. Be whole. Heal every knee pain, every, every arthritis. I keep getting arthritis. If you have arthritis, just believe the Lord right now. And just believe the Lord. Begin to move by faith in Jesus' name. Receive, receive, receive. Receive the healing power of the Lord. Move your knees if that's you, your hands, your back. Just, just move by faith. Move by faith in the name of Jesus. If you need to stand, Stand up and test it out in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for healing that pelvis in the name of Jesus. That There's a, like an arthritic condition either in the hip or the pelvis. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, would you just lift your hand here? If there's somebody with that, do you have like a painful uh, arthritic or a painful condition in the hip? Is there anyone here? here? Anyone? Where? Oh, right there. Father, in Jesus' name, I just thank you for that. Be whole in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Can we all stand, please? Next week, I'll minister to the sick again, and we will take testimonies. Would you go ahead and check your body right now, actually? Go ahead, go ahead, quickly, check your body. Check your body. How many of you felt a change in your body when you took communion? Anybody? Wave at me. Wave at me if you felt a change. Yep, yep, thank you, Jesus. Two there, thank you, another one there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yep, another one there. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and check right now. Just give it another 30 seconds. The Lord's not done. Go ahead and check. Check your body again. Don't look for your pain. Look for your healing. 
telling you there's power in communion. There's power. Go ahead and check now. If you felt the Lord has healed you significantly better, I want you to lift your hand the moment you feel that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Yep, there's another one there. Thank you, Jesus. I give you praise. We're going to take all the details next week, so I want you to come back. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. There's another one there. Thank you, Jesus. This is how the Lord works. You value him and give him respect, and he just keeps going. Yep, there's another one there. Thank you, Jesus. Make sure we get all these. Another one here. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give the Lord praise. Thank you, Lord. Let's do this very quickly before we go. I want all of you to turn around stretch your hands to the camera. Thousands will watch this by tomorrow morning. Let's stretch our hands in faith now. Come on, well, let's get in here and believe this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we speak to every sickness, and we curse it and rebuke it in your body. Precious Jesus, flow and touch those people around the world in their homes, in their cars, uh, in dorm rooms, in hospitals, in prisons. Let your healing power flow. Wonderful Holy Spirit, move, move, move and heal your people now. Let cripples walk, let blind eyes open, let ears open in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let incurable diseases go to glorify the name of the Lord. We bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If the Lord has healed you as you're watching, be sure to send us that message. There'll be a, an email address there in the comment feed. Can we give the Lord praise? I love you guys. I'll see you next Sunday night. God bless you. Have an amazing week. Good night. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus shed his blood. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again from the dead on the third day to give you life and to prove that he is the Son of God who he said he was. Today he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And for those who belong to him, he is interceding for them eternally. And that same Jesus will return again. He will crack the eastern sky like a whip. And with ten thousands upon ten thousands, he will return in glory. In 2017, we received a word from Lou Engle that we really believe is the word of the Lord for our school, our house, and the entire ministry. Lou said that the greatest musicians in the world, and the greatest vocalists in the world, the greatest worshipers, that they would descend upon Orlando, Florida to Jesus' image. And that word began to burn in us, and we began to dream about what it would look like to one day have a school where people would come to worship Jesus and be in his presence and receive his word. And a church was birthed in that same worshiping atmosphere. What a beautiful opportunity that we have as a Jesus people to come before him and to be at his feet and to pour ourselves out before him. Worship has the potential to unlock things that really nothing else in the world can unlock. And so we decided about a year ago to launch a, an opportunity within the Jesus School setting for those worshipers, for the musicians, for the singers, for the dancers, for the artists. 
for the poets. And this is going to be a place where you can come and you can learn and you can grow. And we have highly trained instructors who are going to be coming. They're going to be teaching instruments. They're going to be teaching vocals. Anything that you can think of with worship, it's going to be there. The worship is not about us. We worship for Him. So we want to invite you to come. Come worship the King of Kings with us. So come and be a part of what the Lord is doing. Come and give your heart to the Lord. Come and surrender yourself to the Lord. And let's be ones that are willing to rise and go. And we decided to name it after Bethany, that wonderful house where Jesus was ministered to, that place where the feelings of Jesus were preeminent. It was a place where he desired to not only move and work and teach and do wonderful things, but a place where he would be adored, a place where he would rest, a place where he would run to so that he would receive ministry. And so now Jesus School has this space that's been created for all of you who are desiring to use your vocal gifts, your instrumental gifts, your gifts of worship, your dancing gifts, and give them to Jesus. Jesus would make this a Bethany, but he'd make our lives a Bethany, where he'd come and rest and recline among us. You were created to experience the presence of God in a way that will transform your life, family, and the world. We understand how difficult it can be to find time to attend a school where you study the Word of God, grow in your faith, and build a community of believers. And that's why we created Jesus School Online. We believe that the Holy Spirit is unlimited in His reach. No matter where you live or what stage of life you're in, we invite you to take part in this amazing online opportunity. You'll be led by world-renowned speakers and worship leaders. You will be taught to seek Jesus daily, be activated in the power of the Holy Spirit, learn to share the gospel, and build community with Jesus people from around the world. At Jesus School Online, we are passionate about seeing a Jesus people raised up to shake the nations for the glory of God. You were created for this moment in history. The Jesus people are emerging and we have one ambition. Jesus himself. Will you join us?